Okay, so here we are again, back. Think plant based. Yeah. Julie and Shane, Shane and Julia. And with Melanie Joy today. We got a special welcome. guest, Melanie Joy. Welcome. Hey. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. We're yeah. so excited to have you. It's such an honor. You know, we heard great stories about you, and now we have you here. Yeah. So please tell the audience more about yourself and about your vegan journey. Um, well, I. I guess my vegan journey, my work um, is very much based on my own vegan journey, probably like most people's work comes from their own journey. Um, like many people, I grew up in the United States and, and like many people in the US and in many places in the world, in fact. Um, I grew up with a, a dog who I loved like a family member. Um, I certainly grew up as a person who cared about animals and would never want to cause them to suffer. Um, and I also grew up eating animals, eating meat, eggs, and dairy. And, um, you know, for so much of my life, you know, over the course of so many years and so many meals, I just never thought about how strange it was, right, that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other, you know, a pork chop um, that had once been an animal who was at least as, as sensitive and sentient and intelligent as my dog. I just didn't connect the dots. And what happened was that one day um, in 1989, I was 23 years old at the time, and um, I ate a hamburger that turned out to be contaminated with Campylobacter, which is like the, the red meat version of salmonella, oh, no. um, the yeah. salmonella of the red meat world, and I got really, really sick, and I wound up um, actually hospitalized on intravenous antibiotics, and after that, I just, the thought of eating meat um, disgusted me. And so I stopped eating meat. And in my mind, it wasn't really for any, um, you know, under, it, it didn't seem like there was any ethical out by the last food I had eaten before getting so sick. And so I had to learn about my new diet and I had to learn how to cook for myself and how to shop for myself. And, you know, as I was learning about at the time it was vegetarianism and then shortly thereafter it became a, a vegan diet um, and lifestyle. Um, I, of course, stumbled upon information about animal agriculture and what I learned. Um, it just shocked and, and horrified me. Um, I, I couldn't believe the extent of the suffering of, of non-human animals. I, I couldn't believe um, the environmental damage. I was also learning about human health impacts of, of eating a carnistic diet or a plant-based, uh, an animal-based diet. Um, and this was back in the 80s, right? This is 89, so there wasn't even a lot of awareness at the time. But but what I was learning really shocked and horrified me. But um, what, what shocked me in some ways even more um, was that nobody I talked to about what I was learning was willing to hear what I had to say. The response was always something like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal or they call me a crazy vegan hippie propagandist and like and this is the response pretty consistently um uh, you know from people who were just like i had been when i was eating animals right it was just people who were rational people who were compassionate um and i just became very curious as to how you know people who cared about animals and, and care about their impact on on others and on the environment and so on and so forth could nevertheless act against these values and act against their own interests and the interests of others without fully realizing what they were doing. And so this was really what led me to do um, the research that I did. And I, I ended up studying, getting a PhD in psychology and I specialized in the psychology of violence and nonviolence. Um, and uh, more specifically for my doctoral dissertation, I researched the psychology of eating animals. Okay. Oh. Wow, that's a pretty deep uh, study there, right? It is. <laughs> yeah, it's not one you really hear about a lot of the times. So uh, we'll get into some questions here. Why do vegans and non-vegans struggle with the relationships and communication with each other, you think? Well, um, I guess picking up from the journey um, that I was just describing to you, um, what I discovered kind of helped shed light on this, this question that you've asked. Um, what I uncovered in my research is that there's an invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. Um, and this is the belief system that I came to call carnism. 
carnism is essentially the opposite of veganism, right? right. We, we tend to believe that, that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system right. when it comes totally. to eating animals. But the only reason that we learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because you know we do learn to follow a belief system when it comes to eating animals. And so this belief system of carnism um, basically needs to coerce people who care about animals and who care about practicing integrity to act against that caring without fully realizing what they're doing. And it does this through distorting their perceptions. It uses a set of psychological defense mechanisms to distort people's perceptions uh, when it comes to meat, eggs, dairy, and the animals they eat and also when it comes to how they think about veganism and vegans, um, it distorts people's perceptions so that they eat animals, certain animals, without really realizing what they're doing. I mean, carnism, for example, causes us to look at a hamburger, if we're not vegan yet, right? To look right. at a hamburger and see it as delicious food, right? But if we were told that that hamburger, or a meat eater, or non-vegan was told that that hamburger was um, from a golden retriever, you know, they would no longer <laughs> see it as food. They would see it as a dead animal and be right. totally disgusted. So, totally. so this causes all sorts of problems for, for individuals, right, um, who really want to make their food choices freely, but don't realize that they're not because they're under the influence of this invisible system, um, clearly causes problems for the animals as well. And it causes problems when a non-vegan who's basically operating with this carnistic mentality, as I call it, is in relationship with a vegan. Because what carnism does, carnism is a, a system of oppression. It's organized around oppression, violence, harm, you know, and it requires people who would normally never want to support oppression to directly support it. Right. And so what carnism does is it conditions people to just really disconnect from their thoughts and feelings when it comes to eating animals. And it conditions people to feel defensive against anything that threatens their feeling of entitlement to eat animals. So this is often vegans. In other right. words, carnism, threat, carnism causes people to feel defensive against or resistant to any information and anyone who delivers that information that would help them get outside the carnistic box. So you have, in many instances, you have this sort of automatic defensiveness that many people bring to their relationships, many non-vegans bring to their relationships with vegans. And on the other side, you know, you have vegans who bring their own psychology into the relationship. And, you know, many people, I know a lot of your listeners are, are, are vegan and can probably relate to what I'm talking about here. Um, becoming vegan is for many people a tremendously empowering experience and it's an mm -hmm. incredibly important experience, there's no question. Um, and at the same time, it also can be very difficult, very challenging. Once you wake up to the fact that you are living in the midst of what can only be called a global atrocity. Carnism is a global catastrophe. It is a global atrocity. Once you wake up to this reality, your life is never the same. And mm -hmm. being awake in this way, living as a vegan in a dominant animal eating culture takes a tremendous toll on us psychologically and emotionally, inevitably. You know, we're, we're, we have empathy, we care, we know what's happening to the animals, to the environment, and yet we can work our entire lives trying to pick up the pieces of the mess that other people are being made, uh, that other people are making, and not only are we never thanked, but we're often even ridiculed you know, and scorned for it. So yeah. there's just a lot of psychological gymnastics that we have to go through as vegans to cope with the fact that we live in the midst of, of insanity, essentially. And many vegans feel incredibly, um, this incredible sense of urgency to communicate this message, you know, and, and to help other people wake up to do everything that they can to stop the bloodshed, essentially. And yet, at the same time, their voices so often fall, you know, uh, people don't hear what they're saying and are so resistant to what they're saying that it really can mess with your mind and it can really cause a tremendous amount of frustration. Many vegans end up feeling, you know, burned out, angry, misanthropic. They become traumatized from seeing, you know, all of this footage about what's happening to the animals. So you have these two psychologies, you know, Right. that come together 
And it's, it's a very, very difficult combination. And the backdrop for all of this is that people, vegans are people and non-vegans are people and people in general get pretty much no formal training in how to have healthy relationships and how to communicate in a way that's effective. So even without the vegan, non-vegan difference in relationships, most people really struggle to relate to each other in a way that is compassionate, respectful, and effective, and to communicate clearly. So it's really a recipe for you know quite a challenging experience when you've got a vegan and a non-vegan in a relationship. And it's also a tremendous opportunity um, to foster healthy, authentic connections with each other. It almost forces you to do that work because you kind of have to do that work if you want to make it, um, you know, make it happen. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I find being vegan made me stronger. I mean, I realized more struggles, but I knew why I'm doing it. And I find that's very important too. Mm -hmm. Why are you vegan? Is it just a trend or is it for the animals? Is it for your health? There needs to be a motivation behind it too to keep on going or you fall back to eating meat some t some people do that too right mm -hmm. no so. you're absolutely right it can be very lonely for many vegans a lot of vegans just feel so isolated um because carnism is invisible still to, to most people anyway mm -hmm. um we don't recognize the carnistic mentality for what it is we don't recognize this defensive mentality for what it is even you know whether you're vegan or non-vegan and we we don't recognize the bias that runs through the dominant culture so for example vegans are called biased whenever we try to challenge the bias of the dominant culture that's right. already there most people don't realize for instance that when you study nutrition you're actually studying carnistic nutrition you know, yeah. you're born into this bias. Yeah. So there's, there are all these ways that carnism distorts perception so that people continue, the world continues to support carnism. And, and a lot of these distortions are, or I should say a lot of these, these carnistic defenses are, um, are directed at discrediting vegans and the vegan movement. So let me mm -hmm. explain this a little bit. Systems like carnism, systems of oppression, they keep themselves alive basically by making sure that they stay stronger than the system that challenges them. So carnism needs to keep itself stronger than veganism. And to this end, we learn in the dominant culture a series of myths we learn to believe in a series of myths, and all of these myths teach us two things. One is that eating animals is the right thing to do. It's valid. Those are the myths that keep carnism strong. They strengthen carnism. We also learn to believe in myths that weaken veganism. So we learn that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. And one of the ways these myths get represented is through... Uh, promoting negative vegan stereotypes, right? right? So we oh, learned yeah. to believe a bunch of <laughs> myths about vegans, right? Uh, vegans are biased. Vegans are overly emotional, sentimental animal lovers. Have you ever heard that one? You know, um, um, kind of. Maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah probably. Yeah, you're well, just too sensitive. Oh, yeah. You're just yeah. too sensitive, right? So, Sometimes, I mean, we yeah. don't recognize is that our emotions of, of sadness or grief or moral outrage at the atrocity that is carnism is act, are actually healthful, appropriate, legitimate responses to the fact that we are witnessing a global atrocity. Much more concerning is the widespread numbing of the dominant culture. But we learn to believe in these, um, you know, these myths about vegans as a form of like, or these negative stereotypes about vegans as a form of, um, as a way to discredit the vegan message. It's a form of shooting the messenger. If we right. shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. Totally. totally. What we hear mostly is like, a lot of people eat meat. Why should I become vegan then? Yeah. Like they don't want to miss out on the food, you know? So it's like, oh. It's a cultural, like herd mentality, I think, formulation. Yeah, exactly. Everyone wants to fit in, right? So if you're the outcast, you're just going to be pushed out of the circle of, of society almost, right? In a way, yeah. People yeah, talk. well, 
Right. They make it, it's, it's, it's normal to eat animals. You know, we learn to believe these myths that it's, it's normal, natural, and necessary to, to eat animals, for example. And then when we break outside of this, we're ostracized or, or marginalized in, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really hard. It's a hard world out there for a vegan. <laughs> it is, to be honest. But an yeah. impressor. <laughs> yeah. But you talk about vegan allies, right? We need them too. What is a vegan ally and why is this subject important? Um, a vegan ally, a vegan ally is the term I use to describe somebody who's not yet fully vegan themselves, um, but who is a supporter of veganism as an ideology and of vegans, right? So we, right. we tend to assume um, in the vegan movement um, that either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. And the problem with this framing, it's understandable for a lot of reasons, but the problem with this framing is that it prevents like 99% of the population from supporting a cause that really needs all the help it can get. And many people are simply like not ready or able or willing essentially to to just go vegan. Um, And yet they are still very sympathetic to the vegan cause. And most people transition to veganism slowly. Um, you know, they move along the spectrum toward veganism and you know, build veganism to their lives over time. So if we give people the opportunity to help support the cause when they're not 100% vegan yet, then we invite a lot of support into the movement. So for example, um, um, some of the people who have done the most uh, actually for the movement and to help animals in terms of impact, in my personal experience, are not vegans themselves. Mm -hmm. They are, Hmm. for example, journalists uh, who interview me and who, who's, or, you know, radio interviews or television interviews reach hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of viewers. They're not vegan yet, but they really believe in the cause and they want to use their influence to help. Right. Some of the people who donate to my organization, Beyond Carnism, um, you know, we're 100% uh, dependent on donations and some of the people who donate to us are not vegan, oh. but they want oh, to wow. help create a more vegan world. So they give us the means necessary to do the work that we do. I encourage people you know, to really, um, when I'm talking about becoming vegan, I try to invite people to be vegan allies um, and also to be as vegan as possible. You know, right. often we, you know, our call to action is like, go vegan. Um, <laughs> and that's challenging for people, but if we encourage people to be as vegan as possible. You know, a vegan ally is somebody who would be as vegan as possible and help mm-hmm. in whatever way they can. We, people can't be more vegan than what's possible for them anyway. And right. it's just a much easier and more gracious and generous and respectful ask. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> no totally. one wants to be forced to do anything, right? right. Same with like trying out vegan, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't force people. And we can't I mean, force people. Legis- no. yeah. Right. I mean, legislation forces forces people, but advocacy does not. Advocacy Mm -hmm. is about communicating in a way that increases the chances that your message will be heard the way that you intend it to be. And the more you try to force somebody, the more they feel controlled and the more they resist what you're saying. So true. Yeah. But sometimes also like people get the image of like being vegan eventually you won't be healthy anymore you know the longer you're vegan then it doesn't work you know there's no scientific proof that it works like on generation after to gener- generation yeah. yeah people get like co- so caught up with that right because it's still as you mentioned many times it's a young movement and we don't really know much about it so people get kind well, of caught up right with that yeah, I mean, sort as a of. social justice movement, it's young, but it's it's not that young. I mean, people have been practicing ethical vegetarianism for at least 3,500 years. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the world's oldest religions are, you know, based on what is essentially veganism, you know, eating a, eating a plant-based diet. So, um, you know, we have, there's like Jainism, for example, and, you know, Hindus have been historically uh, vegetarians. So there are plenty of long lived vegetarians and vegans. And today there's just a tremendous amount of literature demonstrating the benefits of a plant based diet and, and the dangers of a carnistic diet. So what I have observed um, 
in, in, in my travels, I've traveled to about 50 countries now, having this conversation with all different types of people, people in you know the mainstream media and also people in positions of leadership in the vegan movement. And this myth that um, you can't be healthy eating a plant-based diet is really rapidly um, losing steam. Um, right or losing support, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, in different places in the world, it's got a greater or lesser amount of support. I mean, sure. some places where the it really is young, people still do believe that if you stop eating meat, you're gonna die. But in <laughs> a lot of places still now, alive. that's not the case anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, it's just whatever I guess someone believes. I mean, you could read a book and it, you know, if that's the side they're selling and you just believe it, then I guess that's where you get from. But it really depends, I guess, on the person and their belief system, right? We all have different belief systems. Or so. certain influencers, right? They talk about how bad veganism is. It didn't work for them. And then they influence other people, like the audience, <laughs> right? It's pretty interesting how even social media works today. Like, mm -hmm. it actually spreads veganism in a good way. Yeah. But then the carnivore diet gets very popular now too, especially here in North America, I find, you know? But then is it really working too, the carnivore diet? We don't know, there's so much confusion, know. right? And you need to pick what works for you, I, I find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and also people, I mean, if people <clears throat> who genuinely want to do less harm for, to animals, you know, don't have to be convinced that a vegan diet is the healthiest diet they could possibly have. They just have to be convinced that they could be healthy enough on vegan diet, um, right. which we know. I mean, there's just, there's a tremendous amount of evidence supporting this today. It's it's interesting because when I'm back in the U.S. now, I, I, I live in Europe now. Um, and when I travel back, I mean, it's just changed so much in the U.S. support for veganism. When I first went vegan, you know, I said it was, I was I was 23 years old. It was 1989. And, you know, my mother thought I was going to die before my 30th birthday. Oh. Um, you know, everybody, people would say you're vegan. And they looked at me like I had two heads. And now when I meet people in the U.S. and I say I'm vegan, it's always completely different response. I mean, first of all, my mother is 80 and she's gone late 70s, 80, um, she's gone vegan in the past several years. Wow. Um, oh, wow. You know, partly for, for animal rights reasons and, and also partly for her health. And she's like very much an advocate of veganism. So there's a big, <laughs> wow. you know, when I go back now, people will, you know, say, oh, you're vegan, oh, that's why you're so healthy or that's <laughs> yeah, why right. you look so young or I wish I could do that, that's great, good <laughs> on you. It's a completely <laughs> different response than it was when I first went vegan. Yeah. Wow. Totally. Try to change. Yeah. So, what are some tips that you can give uh, people uh, about having effective communication with uh, non-vegans? I believe. Yeah. Well, I think this one tip actually, well, a couple of things. Um, it's really my book, Beyond Beliefs: uh, A Guide to Improve um, Communicate Relationships and uh, Communication for Vegans, Vegetarians, and, and Meat Eaters, is really meant to be sort of a one-stop guide to how to practice healthy ways of relating, especially when you have this potential ideological difference. But you can also apply the um, principles and tools I share in in that book to vegan vegan relationships as well because as you might know vegans don't always get along with other vegans um, or any kinds of relationships I should say right. when you do have a difference in uh, your relationship this particular difference veganism and um, carnism essentially it's really important to get informed it's really important to understand these different ways of thinking these different ways of life it's very important for non-vegans to try to understand carnism i have a chapter in the book for non-vegans and vegans about carnism and how carnism hijacks the relationship essentially when a vegan is in a relationship with a non-vegan they're essentially in a relationship of three not of two there's the vegan the non-vegan and carnism carnism is present in the relationship with you oh. and so rather than you know seeing each other as opponents that's what carnism does it causes vegans and non-vegans to see each other as opponents right. it's important to recognize that the real problem is carnism and you can unite against this intruder in the relationship so uh -huh. one step is just building awareness of carnism how it distorts perceptions, how it causes non-vegans to feel automatically defensive against vegans, um, some of the myths that it creates in my, our minds. Um, another important um, tip is to com 
to focus more on the process than on the content of a communication. And um, so this is a tip that applies to any communication. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about veganism or, or you know, whether to go in or stay out on a Saturday night. Um, every conversation, every communication has these two parts. It has the content, which is what we're communicating about, and it has the process which is how we're communicating. Right. We people tend to overfocus on the content and underfocus on the process, but the process actually matters more. So, for example, if you think about a conversation that you had like maybe a week ago or maybe even 6 months ago, it's possible that you have forgotten the content entirely. You don't even remember what you talked about anymore, but you probably still remember how you felt in that conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. The process determines how you feel. So when your process is healthy, you can talk about anything without arguing. And when your process is unhealthy, you can't talk about anything without arguing. You might know people <laughs> who are like really on the same page, but they'll always find a reason to argue with each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, in yeah. a healthy process, when your process is healthy, your goal is not to be right which means to make the other person wrong. It's mm -hmm. not to win, which means to make the other person lose. Your goal is mutual understanding. Right. It's to understand the other person's thoughts and feelings and to have the other person understand your thoughts and feelings. So to create a healthy process, you need to number one, commit to this goal. And it doesn't mean that you don't want a particular outcome at some point, but the first step has to be mutual understanding. And to create a healthy process, not only do you need to have this as, as your goal, and you know, if you notice in a conversation that you're starting to get stressed and you know, check, pause, and ask yourself, is this other person seeming to be pushing an agenda on me to be right, and, or am I trying to be right in this conversation? And then, um, you know, recognize the, the formula for a healthy process, and it is based on two parts. One is practicing integrity, and the other is honoring dignity. And this, by the way, it applies beyond even communication. It applies to all of our interactions and relationships. Sure. So the formula for healthy relating, healthy communicating is the same. Communicating is just the primary way we relate. It's practice integrity, and integrity by definition is the integration of our values and behaviors. So when you practice integrity, you practice the two core moral values are compassion and justice. Right. So you practice compassion towards somebody else or justice, which is fairness. So if I'm practicing integrity toward you, I'm treating you with compassion and I'm treating you in a way that's fair. It's basically being respectful. So practice integrity and honor dignity. When you honor someone's dignity, that means you think of them and treat them in a way uh, that shows, you think of them as though they have fundamental worth as a being on this planet. They are no less worthy of being alive or being treated with respect than anyone else on this planet. Right. So when you practice integrity and you honor dignity, the result is an increased sense of connection and an increased sense of security in that interaction, in that relationship. And if you think about your own experiences in your life, you know, think about a relationship that you feel is a pretty good relationship. Maybe it's your relation, your relationship, right? That you feel is a pretty good relationship. Chances are you feel connected. Chances are you feel secure with each other. Mm -hmm. Chances are you trust that the other person is gonna practice integrity toward you. And chances are you feel that that other person sees you as being a worthy of being treated with integrity, of being treated with respect. And if you think about the opposite, right, if you think about a relationship in your life that's like not a good relationship or even just an interaction, this formula applies to everything. It applies to a brief interaction with the cashier at the grocery store. It applies to an online troll communicating with you, it applies to long-term relationships, it applies to how we relate to other animals, 
Right. It applies to how social groups relate. It applies to how we relate to ourselves. We're always talking to ourselves and relating to ourselves, right? Chances are, if you think about a relationship that you have that's not a great relationship, maybe it's a troll, you know, online, you probably notice that they don't practice integrity towards you. <laughs> so they violate, they violate their integrity and right. they harm, harm your dignity. And this causes you to feel disconnected from them and insecure with them. So this is the formula for a healthy process. This is a formula that you can revisit at any moment, at any moment in your day. When you're in a communication, when you're in an interaction, when you're just thinking about your relationship in general, and you can ask yourself, you know, if you're feeling stressed, you feel like something's off, you can ask yourself, wow, am I really practicing integrity here? Do I feel like this other person is practicing integrity to me? Um, do I feel connected? Do I feel secure? And then you can, you know, change your behaviors accordingly. Um, my newest book is almost newest book, actually second to newest book. It came out this year. It's called getting relationships, right? And it's really a one-stop guide to improving relationships and communication. I talk about this and, and really how to apply this formula, um, throughout that book. Right. Wow, super interesting. You really need that because sometimes yeah. we get so caught up when someone is mad at us or yell yells at us, right? We get mad too. It's tunnel vision where yeah. you don't see anything. It's just, you know, totally. trying to hurt that person and you're not even thinking of what you're saying anymore. Yeah, right. We want to be heard and, yeah. you know, like veganism and animals are <laughs> suffering and all this stuff, especially when I, yeah. the first years I was um, vegan, you know, it was like, so I wanted everyone to know. I even had like little booklets, why vegan, you know, in my bag. And always like giving it out whenever someone asked me, why are you vegan? Because you would hear that yeah. all the time. And I got tired of justifying myself why I'm vegan. You know, <laughs> I just wanted to be a normal person. We don't ask people why they why do they eat meat? Right. But for vegans, I always exactly. felt like we had to, to or still we have to justify. justify oh, where are you action. getting your protein? Yeah. Like all of a sudden people act like they're nutritionists, uh, yeah, nutritionists you know, they're <laughs> yeah. experts. Oh, why yeah. do you have to supplement? That can't be natural, you know? All yeah, and you're totally, I mean, you make great points. And like, you know, as you said, Shane, like sometimes, you know, you just are so you're triggered, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. You're triggered. You're just like, so upset. You're basically hijacked, at which point it feels impossible to apply this formula. Yeah. So and, and that's true. I mean, it, it's, it's very, um, you know, one of the things that's really important is to, to recognize, we all know how important this formula is, you know, how, at the same time, you know, most of us don't apply it on, on a consistent basis. And so an important step is awareness. Like what is it that gets in the way of us treating others and ourselves in a way that will create a greater sense of connection and security so that we have the kinds of like relationships and communication we want. And, um, for vegans, um, and, you know, for people, there are so many different answers to that question, right? One big um, piece for vegans that I think is really important to be aware of is um, the impact of witnessing and being aware of the violence inherent in carnism. Um, many vegans do not realize the impact that this has on them psychologically and emotionally, and it is one of the reasons that they can end up going from like zero to a hundred in a conversation. Like, um, right. their you know frustration builds up, of course, and you know a lot of vegans know what it feels like to be chronically disrespected because unfortunately it still is socially acceptable to talk to and about vegans in a way that would be considered completely inappropriate to talk to you know other people of other ideological um, groups right. um, and it's hard you know and sometimes our anger is a you know it's a very it's a valid um, legitimate response to being treated in a way that's not just that's not fair um, anger is you know a lot of vegans struggle with anger and it's important to have an understanding of, of what anger is so and how to how to process anger and relate to anger in a way that's healthy so it doesn't become a problem for us as vegans or as people really our anger is um anger is a normal and a healthy response to injustice to experiencing or witnessing injustice or unfairness um our anger is a sign that our moral compass is working 
Right. Um, and it's it, it inspires us. It empowers us to stand up against injustice and take action. When we relate to our anger in a healthy way, that means we recognize our anger for what it is, an indication that something might be an injustice. It's not always an injustice. It might be our perception, you know, that, that something's an injustice. Right. But when we relate to our anger in a healthy way, it means we recognize it for what it is, an emotion that suggests that we are witnessing an injustice or experiencing an injustice. <clears throat> when we relate to our anger in an unhealthy way, <clears throat> that means that we um, are blended with it sometimes, meaning that our anger has consumed us, hijacked us, basically. We're looking at the world through the lens of our anger. We're not recognizing it simply as an emotion that is giving us information about our experience that is important for us to be curious about and learn from, but rather we and the anger become one, right? And right. so we're not able to think as rationally. Um, and when our, we relate to our anger in an unhealthy way, it has the charge of contempt. So contempt is, is an indication that we've put our pl we've placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority. We're looking at somebody as morally inferior. Right. Um, as being less worthy of being treated with respect than we or anybody else on the planet is. So you're a bad person, therefore you're less than. You don't deserve to be treated with respect. Contempt is a red flag, um, you know, that we are buying into this illusion that we are somehow morally superior or worth more worthy of being treated res with respect than anybody else on this planet. And um, so that's really important to become to become aware of. We can also experience contempt toward ourselves. Right. And a lot of us beat ourselves up, look down on ourselves, shame ourselves. Shame is the flip side of contempt. Um, <clears throat> shame is the feeling of being inferior or less than, and contempt is the feeling of being superior or better than. Both of these emotions are red flags that we are not practicing the formula I talked about earlier. Right. They're oh. both red flags. We can be angry at somebody's behavior without perceiving them as somehow being an inferior being and ourselves as being superior to them, particular morally superior to them. Right. So it's important for vegans to, to be aware of this because um, if not, you know, when we're not, it's important for people to be aware of it. But when we're, you know, when we're advocates and we're promoting a moral issue or an ethical issue, it can be easy to fall into this pattern of thinking, this way of thinking. And right. it really harms us as vegans and it harms others too. And, and vegans also can be subject to um, being traumatized from witnessing the suffering that they've witnessed. And when you're, you know, when you're seeing what's happening to the animals, you can develop a form of PTSD from that. It's actually called STSD, secondary traumatic stress disorder, or sometimes it's just called secondary traumatic stress. And um, the problem, there are lots of problems with developing secondary traumatic stress, but it, it causes you to have less um, control. I don't want to say control. It causes you to relate to your anger and other emotions in a way that's not healthy. And it can really lead you to burning out and to um, taking other people down with you if you're not mindful of how you're interacting with them. Right, yeah, yeah, I find it hard when we go to a supermarket, you know, there's like these fish tanks and a bunch of like crabs and lobsters. And I mean, almost every week you see a new load coming in and they're stacked up, you know. Sometimes I see like people ordering it fresh, right? And then they get slaughtered fresh there. But that's like mm -hmm. very traumatic for me. And I don't even sometimes know how to handle it. And, mm -hmm. and for me, I, yeah. I can't stand it just to ignore the truth. I know it's harsh, but I, I'm a person. I like to see the truth. I like to see what's going on. Or when I'm in Hong Kong, you know, I saw turtles getting slaughtered on the side of the road. But I want to see all this stuff, you know, even if it's traumatic. I like it's it, a yeah. reminder for you. Yeah, I don't know. But I you tell don't other see it people all the time. about it. But yeah, right. I don't want to see well, it all the time. It feels not good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem with witnessing, the problem is that, I mean, if you're already a part of the solution, if you're already working to change the problem, you don't need to feed the trauma that's already inside of you. 
um, right. because you re-traumatize <laughs> yourself. And we have a movement that's full of walking trauma survivors right now because <laughs> yeah. a lot of vegans feel a sense of obligation and they feel somehow like witnessing what's happening is helping the animals. But what it often is doing is causing us to be increasingly um, frustrated, feeling hurt and helpless and, and feeling grief and, and traumatized so that we're less effective ambassadors for the cause. Totally. You know, one of the key reasons that people burn out is because they over witness um, and vegans often also make others unintentional witnesses. You know, they talk about the terrible things that they've seen to other vegans or to other individuals who, yeah. you know, then end up taking it in and, and, and catching that trauma. Like they've done studies, you know, trauma is contagious. When people yeah. hear about traumatic material from somebody else or even when they just interact with somebody who's traumatized, they can start taking on the qualities or characteristics of trauma themselves. So we have to be really careful as a movement to limit the amount of, of witnessing we do of this really graphic material because um, if we don't, we are at risk of burning out and even if we don't burn out, we become increasingly, increasingly misanthropic and increasingly dysregulated, emotionally dysregulated. That means that we struggle to regulate our emotions. And, um, you know, so when we, a lot of vegans I've talked to over the years have said they feel like, um, they feel guilty if they stop witnessing and seeing. And they think the least I can do, given what the animals are going through, the least I can do right. is to spend two minutes and see what's happening to them. But, but I don't, that's not actually helping the animals. You watching is not helping the animals. I'm not saying you, but you know, <laughs> right. hey, yeah, yes. yeah. it's yes. not, exactly. it's not yeah. helping the animals if it's feeding your trauma. Right. Um, it, it's causing you to be more traumatized, which ends up causing you to be a less effective ambassador for the animals, right. for most people anyway. So one of the things I have suggested to vegans in the past, and, and this is not true for everybody, of course, you know, your experience might be very different, but for many vegans, um, it's the the trauma for many people what happens is that you know you think of your think of this trauma as an entity that's taken up residence inside of you and it wants to keep itself alive and the way that it keeps itself alive is by convincing you to feed it with more material that that feeds your trauma right and making you feel guilty when you stop doing that mm -hmm. and the, one of the problems with doing this is that when we are traumatized it affects us in, in a, a whole variety of ways, but one way that it affects us is by causing us to start thinking differently than we did before we became traumatized. It causes us to start to look at the world as though it's one gigantic traumatic event with only three roles to be played, because in a trauma, there are only three roles to be played. You can either be a perpetrator or you can be a victim and if you're not a perpetrator or a victim, then you're a hero. Right. And what we do when we become traumatized is we start placing everybody, including ourselves, into one of these three roles. roles. And we lose our capacity for nuance, for the gray areas. So you can see this, right? You guys might have seen this in the vegan movement with mm -hmm. you know vegans creating vegan heroes. Right. You know, yeah. and like- All the time. Or, or we all go and watch the same, like, slaughterhouse footage which we already know what's going on in there but the whole room is full of vegans i yeah. i don't understand that concept right. to me it just right. seems weird but um yeah it's just feeding the trauma i feel for me so i try right. to it, not go to as many yeah it does it does and and there's a way that like it's it's there's a natural almost a natural tendency to want to feed it um and at the same time it's really important not to and some vegans have right. said to me not some a lot of vegans have said to me, I'm afraid that if I stop watching, I'm gonna stop caring. Oh, and wow. you know, and I would say to them, give yourself permission to let your trauma go. That's your trauma talking, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, once you know, you will never unknow. Just because you stop feeling trauma doesn't mean you don't have empathy anymore. Right. If you're a person with empathy, and a person who's aware of what's happening, you're never going to go back exactly. to the way that you used to be. The difference is that you will, you know, come to your 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 activism from a place of, of 
of mindfulness and of self-connection and of empowerment, not from a place of trauma. When we come to our activism from a place of trauma, it has that burning sense of urgency, that edge, that desperation, and that tendency to turn people into the bad guy, to mm -hmm. make, to look for the perpetrator and take them down. Right. Yeah, basically like the story of, yeah, like you said, the the protagonist the antagonist we have to find someone to fight against even though exactly. they might not even really be the enemy they're just <laughs> happen to be in carnism as you say like right. just yeah exactly them. yeah i just find it sometimes like upsetting when i see animal suffering that so many people don't know about it and i feel like i wish i could do more you know that's like what f makes me feel upset and really like i wish i could do more and i wish more people would know about it because i still feel Sometimes I live in this vegan bubble. Oh, there's so many vegan products and I have these vegan friends, but I don't want to live in a vegan bubble. I want to see the reality so I can see what I can change, you mm -hmm. know, and what people are still lacking, like people are lacking in communication a lot. Right. And we learned a lot from you how to communicate properly. And I wish more people would be open to just communicate properly to people. I think that's where we can reach more veganism to people and not in a religious way no like spreading the truth how animals are suffering i yeah, find that absolutely. people even know yeah. the truth and they still just don't want to right face the truth we have that all the time where people <laughs> all are like the time i know get a lot you? of people you know? know what's going on yeah they right? just don't want to know what's going on with their eyes closed yeah they they tell you like oh yeah, yeah. it's really bad how animals are suffering yeah, and then the I next day they're to. eating the steak they, they know about it. They're right. already speaking like they're, you know, vegan ally. And then they go ahead and just continue on with what they're used to. I know. Yeah. I mean, people don't change until people don't change until they're ready to change. I mean, one yeah. of the nice things about asking people to be as vegan as possible is it makes it easier for them to change. They don't feel like this. It's this all or nothing thing. Like, right. you know, I'm not going to allow myself to really know on a deep level because I'm not ready to totally change. I'm afraid that if I do, I'll lose my relationships or my friendships or I'll be the weird person in my group or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But if they know that they can be as vegan as possible and be a part of the solution, then they're much more likely to be open to taking in these ideas. And the truth is, you know, unfortunately, there are like 8 billion or so people alive in the world today. And, um, and a lot of those people are not yet ready to hear this truth. Um, but a lot of them are. And that's why it's important for us to really make sure that we're strategic in the kind of outreach we're doing. I mean, do you want to spend, you know, month after month trying to get your uncle Bob to finally go vegan. You know, if I can, I know there's a heart of gold in there. If I can just get through to un uncle Bob, I'll <laughs> yeah, have I've heard, succeeded. Heard that <laughs> many know? times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but do we want to spend our energy there or yeah, like, right. you know, focus on the low hanging fruits there for sure. every person who says I could never do that. Or they're at the McDonald's drive through the day after watching <laughs> earthlings or whatever, you know, there are a lot of people who are very open and very receptive. And, you know, for all vegans, I really encourage them to, um, you know, if you really care, and many, many people, most people become vegan because they really do care. They care deeply, and they really want to do be as effective as possible with the short time they have here on the planet. Right. And one of the most important things to do is to learn how to be as effective as possible. You know, advocacy, most people get no training whatsoever in, in how to communicate and how to be an advocate. Um, right. mm -hmm. But the information is out there. Um, we established the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy for this particular reason. I have a handful of books that are designed specifically to help vegans, um, and they can also be used to help non-vegans learn how to communicate and re relate effectively and how to make strategic decisions when you're deciding uh, whether to communicate and you know what kind of outreach even to do. So I really encourage people who feel passionately and want to make a difference to invest the time in developing the skills to be able to be as effective an ambassador as you can be. Because if you can increase your effectiveness even by 10%, you know, and most people, given that they've gotten no training whatsoever, don't just increase their effectiveness by 10% when they start learning. They double it, triple it. They exponentially increase their effectiveness. If you can do that, you will make a much bigger difference for the movement, for the animals. That's great. Yeah, totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. I actually have another question about what's the psychology behind when someone 
becomes vegan because of animal rights, but then after two decades uh, decides to eat meat again. Like I know there's so many factors, <laughs> but what's usually your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really depends on the person. Um, you know, I the the dominant culture, the dominant carnistic culture is really structured to make it very easy for people to slip back into the carnistic cocoon of unknowing. I mean, the whole culture is structured to make it easier to eat animals. It's more normal to eat animals. It's like more convenient to eat animals. It's your friendships get easier often, you know, your social yeah. relationships. Right. Um, so for some people, um, you know, they just, there, there is this constant or this ongoing pressure to pull, to conform back into the carnistic norm. Right. And nobody is immune to that really. And people in particular who don't have enough support, I've, I've met a number of vegans who just, you know, living, uh, feeling just so disconnected from other vegans, so disconnected from the vegan community, and were so under assault from the people around them who mm -hmm. didn't understand them, who, you know, often just ostracized them, maybe even ridiculed them, that it was just too hard for them to continue. Now, fortunately, this is something that's really changing, um, you know, because pe there are online communities um, that people can be a part of if they're not living in, you know, an area where they can actually meet in person other vegans. Um, and it's a reason that another reason that we i believe need to really commit to making this movement as resilient as possible a resilient movement is secure and connected as i was talking about before it's the formula again you know if our movement is 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 more resilient it, people will want to stay in it they will feel um connected to the vegan community and that will um significantly probably significantly reduce the chances that people want to leave the community and go back to eating animals um you know studies have shown that when people stop being vegan or stop being active you know one of the key reasons is because they have had negative experiences in their workplaces vegan workplaces or, or a vegan community right yeah that makes yeah. sense thanks yeah that makes sense right it's just uh hard when they already know like i said they already know it but they just want to keep those eyes shut and yeah it's a hard one <laughs> it is yeah i mean we're constantly changing right like our personality or in general right so people make decisions good or bad i mean it's up to them it's their choice right yeah Ultimately. Well, it's also like, you know, change for animals, you know, change is, is like the kind of change that we're working towards is not the kind of change that happens one person at a time. A lot of vegans get right. really upset about one person who's stopped being vegan. Um, but really, if we're we want to change the world and we're serious about changing the world, we need to change institutions. We need to get, you know, plant based meats manufactured more effectively. We need to like really influence key influencers um people are individuals and you know one two three fifty a hundred a thousand vegans you know who stop being vegan is uh probably not gonna have it's not gonna have a significant impact on the trajectory of this movement right right that makes sense yeah and you're located in berlin right now right yeah yes i moved to berlin about six and a half years ago oh nice oh, wow. i actually was born there yeah, grew up there. born and raised there yeah oh we yeah we go back often oh, actually yeah, we, yeah do. we love going and back. actually i i am my sister and i we know your husband sebastian like when we became vegan you know like in 2000 he was part of uh Vebu and we became friends and stuff so it's so nice to see that you guys got married such a perfect couple you know oh. power couple <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I remember Vapo in the old days. So, well, maybe when we can all travel again, we'll see you here in Berlin one day. Sure. Yeah, that'd be yeah. nice. That'd oh, be lovely. Great. And do you have any future plans? We would like yeah. to know. And where, where can the listeners find you? Um, they can come to our website is carnism.org. Um, and the books that I mentioned to you um, are available on carnism.org and veganadvocacy.org will take people directly to our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy if they're interested in learning about um, our advocacy trainings and webinars. Great. And are you writing any more books in the future or are you going, to, are you doing any online events? 
Yes, we're doing um, a number of online events. Um, we just actually had the first workshop for um, vegans and non-vegans to attend together, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to be running that again. We'll let let you know about that. We'll have that actually up on our on our websites when we're on our social media when when it's right. ready. But um, yeah, it was a workshop for vegans and non-vegans to attend together to learn how to relate and communicate more effectively for non-vegans who want to be allies to the vegans in their lives. Um, so that was very exciting. And um, yeah, we're really excited about building out our, our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, or SIVA, and offering um, more trainings in building relational skills and communication skills and advocacy skills. Right. Amazing. That's great. So yeah. helpful, so inspiring. Busy, 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 busy. Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for what you're doing for the vegan community in general, mm -hmm. for the world. You know, for the vegan allies and people that don't even like vegans. You know, they feel inspired just hearing you. You know, and thanks so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, thank you too, both of you. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for using your platform and reaching people and just keeping this conversation going and getting out there as widely as possible. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, and thanks so pleasure. much for your time again and enjoy the rest of your evening yeah. in Germany. You <laughs> too. Okay. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Ciao. Take care. <laughs>